We're really pleased to have Chrissy Fanganello here today as our speaker. Um, we're live streaming today's talk, so if anyone's out there live streaming, welcome as well. I'm sorry that, like I said last year, the hors d'oeuvres will have to be um, virtual. Um, and we will post this lecture. We'll have a recording that will be on the website of the department. So if you want to go back and watch it, share it with a colleague or a friend, or you students, if you want to share it with a, a, a peer, then please do so. That'll be great. We recently established the Michael Kite Distinguished Lecture Endowment. Uh, if you'd like to see this lecture continue and hopefully expand, because our idea is not only to have this event here in Moscow in honor of Michael, but to go on the road uh, in the region. Uh, and if we have a little bit more funding, we'll be able to do that. So our speaker uh, would be able to travel with uh, perhaps Dr. Kite and another faculty member to another place, perhaps Portland or Seattle or Boise or Spokane, another university or perhaps another city. And that's our intent in the future. So please consider donating to this fund. Uh, and those of you who are students, it's not too early to establish a, a sort of a habit. A few dollars, ten dollars, would be really greatly appreciated. Just go to www.uidaho.edu uh, I'm sorry, uidaho.edu slash giving. And then if you just put the word kite in, and it's K-Y-T-E, not K-I-T-E, um, you'll get to where you need to go. The other option would be to, to send a check to the department and say that you want to go to the kite endowment. We'll make sure it gets into the pot. So I, I hate to mention that. I'm not here to, to um, make money, but um, this is such an important event for the department and for the college, um, and this is what we do to honor um, our faculty. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Kite. Michael was born in Los Angeles. That's where he first developed his interest in transportation, and he has told the story many times. And those of you who have been here in previous years know the story. He used to watch uh, planes land at LAX. Um, he received his BS in systems engineering from UCLA, so he didn't actually uh, become an aerospace engineer. I think you like landing more than taking off. Is that what I understood? He likes both, he's assured me. Uh, after uh, UCLA, uh, Michael moved to Northern California. He received his master's degree in civil engineering from CU, uh, UC Berkeley. He then worked about 10 years in Portland, uh, working on public transit system in Portland. Um, and as I said last year, that's where he learned that uh, public is critical to the success of any public project. Mm -hmm. Then he received his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Iowa. During his last semester at Iowa, he took a course entitled Fiction Writing for Engineers. Um, I, I know I told that story last year as well, but I'm making it a little shorter this year. This year, this is where he met his wife, Marty Ford, who was studying mechanical engineering and is with him today. Michael was a member of the University of Idaho faculty for about 30 years, and for about half that time, he served as the director of NIAT, the UI's uh, Transportation Research Center. It's my distinct pleasure, it's my honor, <clears throat> Excuse me, to introduce our colleague, our mentor, and our good friend, Michael Kite. So thank you all for coming. This this is a real I have, you have to vote. vote. Oh. Thank you again all for coming. This this is really <laughs> an honor for me to be tethered to you as well. Um, and especially thanks to Patricia and members of the department who established uh, this, this lecture series. To say I'm humbled is really um, not quite, quite saying enough because I am, and it really means a lot. Um, my wife, Marty, just joined me in retirement several weeks ago, and I promised her never to use this line again. And our, our, She's saying, oh no, our marriage is gonna end, I think, soon. <laughs> she continues to be the green light on the arterial of my life. That's a traffic engineer joke. And, and you can't use it next time. And, and I can never use it again, it's, I know. <laughs> but uh, thank, thank you again all for coming. And Chrissy, thanks for coming. I had a wonderful time last night learning about your work and about your ideas in transportation. I think you're all in for a treat today. So thanks again very much. Can we end together? Yes, we're, we're free. All right. Thank you, Michael. So now let me introduce our let me introduce our speaker. Again, it's it's complicated. Oops. Chrissy Fanganello describes herself as city builder, 
cultural transportation and transformation professional and former director of the transportation mobility for the city of November because she just stepped down from that job after s many years and she'll probably talk a little bit more about that in a bit. She received her bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, then she did her master's degree in urban and regional planning at the University of Colorado in Denver. In fact, she's teaching a course at uh, CU Denver right now entitled Bike Pedestrian Transit Planning. Um, Chrissy spent the last 12 years working uh, for the city of Denver in the Department of Public Works. Uh, she started as a senior city planner and was promoted to the Director of Policy Planning and Sustainability in 2008 and again in 2014 to Denver's first Director of Transportation and Mobility. In her last two roles, she elevated the importance of transportation planning, operations, and investments toward a multimodal transportation uh, transformation. Um, she oversaw transportation planning, engineering, operations, parking, mobility services citywide. She oversaw the policy, the uh, institutionalization and implementation of the city's mobility vision, including key initiatives like Denver's Mobility Action Plan, uh, the Smart City Challenge Grant Pursuit, Denver Moves Bikes, any of that sound familiar? <laughs> transit uh, Moves Bikes, Transit, Pedestrian, and Trails Plans, and Denver's Vision Zero Action Plan. The voter approved uh, 2017 general obligation bond, which gave a lot of money to transportation projects in the city, was also, uh, she was very much involved in. Um, she sits on the board for Denver Bike Sharing and recently completed time on the boards of the Denver Regional Council of Governor, uh, Governments and the National Association of City Transportation Officials. She also, that's how I found you, by the way, NACTO. <laughs> NACTO, look up NACTO, all these really smart people. And most of them are women, am I right? Yeah, the leadership is women right now. She also served as president and board member for the Colorado chapter of the Women's Transportation Seminar International and was honored as a 2014 WTS Colorado Woman of the Year. I'll say no more, but I will introduce Chrissy Fanganello, How to Drive Success When Innovation Disruption is the Norm. Okay, we working? We gotta switch over. Thank you, Patricia, and uh, for having me. Um, I'm just really pleased to, to be here in Idaho and have the opportunity to speak in front of an overflowing room of people. Uh, the, the visit here so far has just been fantastic. Um, I've met all kinds of lovely people um, in a really lovely town of Moscow that I have not had the opportunity to be in before. I have um, been in Idaho before, but not this part. So thank you for um, finding me on NACTO and inviting me to, to be here and spend some time with you today. Um, this presentation, how to, how to Drive Success When Innovation and Disruption is the Norm, is really a, a culmination of some of the work that I've been doing at the city and in transportation for the last 12 years or so. Um, we've had the opportunity to watch transportation change and sort of our approach to transportation change from one that was much more auto-centric to one that is much more sort of people-centric, human-centric, community-building-centric. Um, and it's not without its challenges along the way in terms of what does that mean and, and how do we actually do this successfully. Uh, and particularly right now when you've got a fair amount of disruption in transportation happening, whether it's a Lyft or an Uber or smart city technology, that are things that are coming at us. And those of us that have worked in the public sector and perhaps as well in, in some of the institutional space, we're not very good at being fast. Um, and so that's a little bit of a challenge for us. So we'll talk about all those things um, this afternoon. And, I think we'll have some time for questions as well. So this is a quote. It's actually written in the building of the Webb Building, the Wellington Webb Municipal Building in the city and county of Denver, which is mostly where I work and many others um, every single day. And, but it's from a time when Denver was first being created and established. And you didn't know you came to make a city. You came to mine for gold, or you came to see what was going on at the 
the convergence of the two rivers in Denver. But what we ended up doing is building a city. And so I take this quote um, really th seriously because the work that we do every single day as city builders, and that's whether you're a, an engineer or an architect or a landscape architect or a planner or a developer, we are all every single day building and shaping our cities. And the way that I've approached my uh, work in transportation is if I'm going to do this work, then what I do should contribute to that human fabric of a city. And I, I think that's an important uh, aspect for all of us to be thinking about, that we are all doing this together. And, and so the more we are thinking about how we do it together, the more successful we will be. I had an opportunity to talk with, with many students today and have conversations in the past over the years. People love to bash engineers. And I've been telling folks for years, like, don't bash the engineers. We need the engineers. But they said, oh, well, they messed everything up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We all need to take some credit for that. The planners and the zoning and the land use and the transportation components, all of those choices. And then as a culture, we made together. Uh, as there's a story I tell about Federal Boulevard in Denver. There used to be, it's a, part of it is a lovely street, part of it is a really terrible street. Um, but there's tree lines, a tree line street on the northern half, and there used to be that there was a double row of trees. And the Parks Department would come and say, oh my gosh, Public Works came through and tore down all these trees. Well, it's because there was a vote in 1954, whenever it was, by the city and county of Denver, by the people of Denver who voted to take down the trees and widen the road. That was the culture. That is what we wanted. And now we're working on how do you shift the culture and do things differently. So it's important for us to remember our history, but also keep a path of looking forward. So this is, I'm teaching this class, Patricia said, bike ped and transit planning. I'm coordinating that with another professor. And she said, what are we going to talk about on the first day of class? And I said, let's talk about what is the public right of way because I don't think we talk about the public right-of-way in a comprehensive way, and we need to. We don't talk about it in a comprehensive way. We don't manage it in a comprehensive way. We might pretend that we do. We show pretty pictures like this. I'll go to the next one, actually. Ah, oh, there you go. It's perfect, right? That's what it looks like. It's all really lovely, and we can say this is where everybody belongs, and so we're going to divide it up, and we make it sound as if it's very simple. And in reality, for those of you that have done work in transportation or work in cities, you know that none of that is simple because it's a finite amount of space and we are all trying to elbow our way in or our little bit, of, our little piece of that, our little piece of the space. So we're pushing and pulling. How do we make the community happy along the way? There's another part of the public right of way that we usually don't talk about. So the public right of way is three dimensional. The airspace up ahead, what are you hanging on your signals? What kind of infrastructure do you need for your uh, light poles, for your pedestrian lighting, for your street lighting? And no one really wants to talk about the bottom part, where the wet and the dry utilities go. Again, all of this is limited space, and it is a valuable asset that the public sector needs to be thinking out about, I would argue, a little bit differently moving forward. Uh, because this is what it really looks like. This is really what we're talking about. Whether we're talking below ground or above ground or in the air, our public sector, our public right of way is this messy, if not more so. Because we don't, we don't know what all that is. We don't know who it all belongs to. How do we say, go back to our previous picture, ah, it's great. Beautiful, we'll just divide it up really lovely and make it all work. But it's really so complicated when we get down into the middle of it all in terms of how we're going to divide that up and how is it going to work. Um, so that comprehensive approach, I think, is something new for us to be thinking about that we haven't in the past. So how do we define the problem moving forward? And some of this might feel like this is the work that we've already done. We define the problem. We know we have, oh, we've got a little error, error going on there, but whatever, uh, a finite amount of space. And that is the biggest challenge. There is only so much public right of way. For the most part, we are not growing our roads or building new ones, particularly in urban areas. We're not doing that because we can't afford to. I talked about Federal Boulevard earlier. The last time we widened Federal Boulevard, um, which was about six years ago, I think, uh, 
It was less than one mile that we widened from five lanes to six lanes. It cost $30 million for less than one mile. Half of that cost was to acquire the public right of way. The other half was to do the actual construction. So we can't afford it financially, but we also can't afford it because people have businesses and homes. It is our community, and we value the community on either side of the right of way. So we have to be thoughtful about how we're going to do things differently. But we also have to think about, as I said earlier, faster. So define the problem. And this, these problems, these I'm picking these from Denver because that's my experience, that's where I've been working, but they're probably not different from many other places across the United States in terms of what are we dealing with. Um, growing economies, growing populations, more and more people dying from crashes on our roadways in a variety of way, methodologies. Uh, the, really thinking about the environment and air pollution and what's the role that transportation plays from green, greenhouse gases. And then just simply taking care of the infrastructure. We have all this infrastructure that we've built, and we can't take care of what we have, yet we're also talking about building something new. How do we provide better access to our people, to all people, so that they have better access to employment and to education and to jobs and to healthcare and to the art museum or the zoo? And how do we do that in a way that really contributes, again, to that access to all people, particularly those that are most vulnerable in our communities? And then we define the future. Like, oh, it's kind of like going back to the public right-of-way picture. Ta-da, there is the future. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be safe and reliable and affordable and accessible. And it's going to be complete and all the networks will be connected. You'll be able to go everywhere with, on a bike or a train or on a bus. You'll have mobility freedom. We'll strengthen the economy and we'll protect our public health and our environment. Sounds great, right? It's, it's a great place to go. So we were starting to have this conversation in Denver. Um, this was back in 2015. And part of the question I posed to the mobility working group, which was senior administration officials and appointees of the mayor, we have goals. And I asked, do they matter? Do we actually care if we ever obtain these goals? Because if we don't, then, then let's stop playing around. But this is what we've got. So define the clear metrics and goals. So they said, yes, we care about these goals, and we have some hard ones, and we're going to put some more hard ones up there. Zero deaths by 2030. We know there's a lot of engineers in here, and it probably makes you really nervous to talk about zero deaths by 2030, because it sounds like it's wildly audacious and probably unobtainable. And maybe it is. But is it still the right goal? I've asked many people, would you rather have it be Vision 10? Any, any volunteers? No, there's not. So we may never get to zero, but still the right goal. Uh, and then the other goals, you know, they are what they are. We have these um, specific goals, and it's important for us to have them so we know what we're trying to look for. We know what outcomes we want as we make investments in our communities and policy decisions. That is a, this is our guiding star. This is what we have to use moving forward. And then we go through the steps. And I'll run through each one of these quickly. Oops. I might have lost my steps. Anyway, so I'll talk about them. Develop the master plans and prioritize the actions. Examine and then adjust your budgets. Make sure that you are actually saying your goals, putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to the budgets. Tell the story beyond the ribbon cutting. Transportation is a long game. It's going to take us many years to talk about and obtain this multimodal future that we're, we're vying for. Politicians, community leaders, elected leaders, they are not always thinking about that long game. They're thinking about the short-term game. Ah, I'd like a ribbon cutting. Ah, that new technology, that shiny object over here, sounds great. Let's go do it. What we're often forgetting to talk about is, does it actually help us reach our goal? And let's use those goals to choose whether or not we are going to go after that particular issue. So staying focused. Beware of the shiny objects and deliver the work. And this is an important one, particularly as a public sector employee. You have to believe in the work that you're doing as staff. But it also really, really, really is helpful to have leaders that will stand there with you and take an error or two, because they're coming. And then we measure and adjust and keep going. So it sounds easy, right? Simple. We've worked with the community. We have agreement. Now we just go out there and implement, and we just we get out there and go. 
but what really happens in the real world. So this is where we're going to go back. I thought I'd change this a little bit, but anyhow. Um, we say we have these master plans, and we go out there and start to, and here's the approach that Denver has taken, I think most cities have taken. I'll pick on the bike plan. So we create a citywide master plan for bikes, and we've got all this community involvement, and we take two or three years to do it, and then we have a whole list of projects that we're supposed to do. So then what do we do? Like, okay, let's prioritize the project, and we pick project number one, and what do we do? We go out to the community, we have a whole other conversation about that one project. And I pick on West 29th Avenue in Denver because I hear from the uh, advocacy community often, they say, hey, we just need to get you more money. If we just get you more money, then everything will be better, and you can build more bike lanes, and then we'll be happier, and it'll be great, right? And I say, well, money is part, of the pro is part of the problem, and it's part of the solution that's important for us to be thinking about. But the West 29th Avenue bike lane came out of the master plan. It took us two years to build the West 29th Avenue bike lane. And it comes all the way down to it. And I said, how long did it take to build the West 29th Avenue bike lane? Any guesses? Five days. A work week. You know how much it cost? <coughs> Not including, well, cost to implement it, $30,000. What took the time was having the conversation with the community about, quite frankly, parking. Because everyone loves a bike lane until in it's in front of their home or business, and then we're going to argue about parking. And I, I love bike lanes, but it can't just be one block over. So how do we have those conversations and really think about this? Because it is the hard work that we're facing every single day in the public sector. If you don't have the support of your, you know, either your uh, leaders within a department or your, your council people or your uh, mayors, then we're just sending our staff out to get yelled at. And it's not a very fun place to be. Oh, here's what I did. So it's also important for us to talk about the story. I talked about that a little bit already in terms of the getting beyond that election cycle, thinking about things differently. How do we tell that story moving forward? We really have to do a better job of that. Transportation is a very personal issue in many ways. We talked with the Mobility Working Group about transportation. We said, OK, what are we going to do if we're going to fix transportation? And first I said, hold on a minute. Tell me a city in the United States of America or anywhere, for that matter, that has fixed transportation. And they all said, oh, OK, you're right. Maybe not. Maybe we won't fix it. But can we make it better? We can make it better. And what is it going to take to do? So they said, oh, let's go around the room. We'll have everyone talk about uh, what, what we could do to make transportation better in Denver. And everyone said, from their very personal perspective, well, if there were a double ride on Alameda and Holly, then, then it would be perfect. No one talked about parking. No one talked about it from a system perspective. So we have to understand our customers and what they're thinking about as they're moving through. And we also have to tell them the story of how we're really serving this greater good in the public community and from a system perspective. And link those two things together with the stories that we have about where we are and where we're going. Um, the way we've been doing things is not that it's been wrong. And this is a conversation I've been having. I had it with some of you today, actually, and had it with many of my staff. They were like, well, you're talking about doing all this new stuff and bike lanes and transit lanes. And the question people often asked was, what did I do wrong? What's going on here? And I would say, nothing. You didn't do anything wrong. You've been doing it the exact right way, but it's the old right way. And for us to move forward from a transportation perspective, we really have to be defining and thinking about what is the new right way in 2018 and beyond, not only for how we're going to think about, plan for, design, but implement this work, and implement much more quickly because we're growing and changing so fast. So let's see. Ah, I did want to mention one thing with regards to the bike flings before we move on is we do these master plans, and I had the opportunity this spring to go to Barcelona and Sevilla uh, with People for Bikes. And I asked the People for Bikes folks, I said, why are we going to Barcelona and Sevilla? I, di I didn't realize they were really known for their bike facilities. And they said, here's what they did in a very short amount of time. They created their master plan, and then they implemented it in like three to six years. Boom. Dropped it all in. And we were like, oh, OK, well, that's interesting. Let's go check it out. So we went over to talk to them, and they said from their perspective, remember the West 29th Avenue bike lane, they said, when we did our master plan, that was our public process. We had concurrence. We had agreement with the community. 
And then we just started building those bike lanes. And they just did it. They didn't worry about everyone being mad about parking. And that's not to say they didn't have issues. I'm sure they did. But they actually just went out and they implemented it. And part of the reason they were able to do that is because they're very committed to the environment and air quality. And that's their driving factor. And they actually asked the question, uh, you know, like, doesn't, don't you guys have something like that? And we're like, that's a whole other conversation that we didn't want to get into. Um, so those are the things that um, we have to continue to think about as we move forward and make sure that a, an important component of that is we're doing this work for the system. We're doing this work for the people, for the city. And who do you hear from when you're having these conversations? It's the usual suspects, we call them. We often joke and say, oh, let's, you know, who's bringing the, the basket tonight of, of hobbies? Because we see the same people all the time. But who we don't see from are those transportation users that don't have time to come to a public meeting. Or maybe they're not comfortable coming to a public meeting because they're afraid. Maybe they don't speak the language. There's a silent majority that we are building a transportation system for. And so we have to be really thoughtful and mindful of the vocal minority that we hear from. And that is a role as, tr as transportation professionals and as city builders. So why is this important? This myth of can we fix traffic and how are we having this conversation with people? And while the context is different in different places in terms of uh, how urbanized you are or how much growth you're experiencing for the city and county of Denver in particular and for the world, we are an urbanizing global place. And so how are we going to take this on and handle the implications of that? Uh, and so I was just looking. I was curious as I was developing this, this presentation, like, what's going on in the world? And, I was blown away by these kinds of numbers of millions of millions of people, 37 million people living in Tokyo. I'm like, oh my God, we're freaking out about moving 700,000 people in the city and county of Denver. Like, that's nothing. And so there is some perception is reality. I took a city traffic engineer of mine to San Francisco a few years ago, and he was completely blown away with how many people are in San Francisco. He said, is it always like this? I said, yeah, it's always like this. So how do we, again, have those conversations with our internal selves, because we're really having to also talk about this with, our, with the public. So our state of problems, too many people, we're too spread out, there's too many cars, there's too many trips, and we have a limited amount of right-of-way, very finite amount of right-of-way that we have to work with. So maybe we can't fix it, but maybe we can make it better. But this is sort of the story that we tell, the old story that we tell, is that the American dream is possible that we can all live in a place like that and have our little house on our little lot. And in some places, that'll be true for a while longer. But in a place like Denver, that's changing it rapidly and has thousands of people moving in. And in the neighborhood I live in, single family houses are being scraped and duplexes are being put in, fourplexes are being put in. It's a changing environment. Several years ago, back in 2002, we had what we call the Blueprint Denver Plan, which was our land use and transportation plan which was great, except for that the Public Works Department didn't participate in it, so that was a challenge. But um, they, they developed what they called areas of change and areas of stability. And the areas of change was like, look, this is where we're going to try to derive the growth. This is where we want this to happen. They've actually been very successful about that, and so that's been good. But the label that we gave of areas of stability, everyone meant, well, nothing will change at all. I'm like, well, it's a city. We're going to be changing. And that's Tokyo, 37 million people. And while I don't think every city is headed towards Tokyo, we need to be thinking differently about what's going on because the infrastructure that we've set up, the way we've set up our infrastructure and the expectation that everyone can have a house and everyone can have a car and we'll just keep spreading out further and further and further from our urban centers and driving and driving and driving and our housing costs may go down but our transportation costs are going up and cities, counties, public uh, organizations, we don't have the funds to take care of that. We cannot support that kind of infrastructure. And so we've, we set ourselves up to say this is the dream, but financially, we actually can't do it. So how do we think about this differently moving forward? The coming disruption. So here we go. Technology will come. It's going to fix everything. We'll be fine. Don't worry. Autonomous vehicles will solve all of our problems, right? 
So the city of Denver was one of the seven finalists for the Smart City DOT Challenge. And one of the first days we were in DC doing sort of the uh, here's what you have to know and get ready for your final submittal in three months time or whatever the heck it was really fast and a lot of work in a short amount of time. There were industry leaders there and we're talking about public private partnerships and how can we do this work better together uh, and it was kind of interesting and kind of exciting and they had the, and it was at that time before, when that initial call came out it was very technology driven and then a couple months went by before we actually all showed up in DC and started having conversations about what the next step was. And in that time frame, it became very clear that Secretary Fox wanted us to focus on ladders of opportunity and vulnerable populations and communities that are uh, left, have been left behind in the past. So I asked a question. There's the autonomous vehicle expert in the room. I said, hi there. Have you guys gone out and had a conversation with our vulnerable populations or communities of need? about their perspectives and needs with regards to autonomous vehicles? And I was pretty sure I knew the answer when I asked the question, but no, they haven't gone out there and talked about it. So how do we as the public sector have conversations about technology with our communities and what do they really need and how will it meet their needs moving forward? And I think it's just something for us to be mindful of, of having those conversations and again, going back to those stated goals and metrics that we had in the first place. Because we don't want to make sure, we want to make sure we're not um, making the wrong investment along the way, or we, don't, we pick the wrong thing, or just mindfully thinking like, well, Hyperloop will fix it, autonomous vehicles will fix it, drones will fix it. And then also thinking too, how does this, these types of solutions contribute back to the built environment? Does it make our city a better place? Does it make my neighborhood a better place? Does it make my community a better place? Or I'm having a really hard time picturing the Hyperloop myself. How does, how does that fit into Denver? Like, where does it go? Who's, who loses their house? Because it doesn't feel like it will fit in very nicely. And the disruption's not just coming, but it's here. All of this is here right now. All of these changes, all of these pressures on our public right of way that is not comprehensively thought about, planned for, or regulated. And that is a challenge for us as staff in cities. It's a challenge as leaders and as professionals. What processes have we put in place to really think through, to say yes or no to things, or ask the right question with regards to what data do we need from those folks? Too often, I think, there's this idea, well, it's coming, and so we'll, we'll say yes, because we want to we wanna be hip, and we want to be cool, and we want to be technologically forward thinking, so we'll just let Lyft and Uber come in but we didn't ask him for any data, and we didn't charge him anything. And what have we learned since Lyft and Uber have been around for a little while? They promise that they're gonna help reduce vehicle miles traveled and reduce congestion. What they're actually doing is increasing vehicle miles traveled and increasing congestion. But we opened our arms and said, come on in at the free market. And so those, I think, are things for us to be thinking about. Um, how do we document these processes and make sure we're sharing them with folks? And, and how do we, how do we, particularly in the public sector, figure out how to move faster? A few years ago, I was at a conference that the Colorado Department of Transportation put on, and there was a gentleman, I don't remember his name, he was from Toronto, and he called himself a futurist, that's what I remember. And he said, it used to be that the biggest was the best. The biggest auto company was the best, you know, what have you. He said, now it's the fastest, whoever's the fastest. And I sat there thinking, oh dear God, we're in really big trouble and from the public sector perspective because we are anything but fast. So, and when we're fast, sometimes we're making bad decisions. So how do we know that this disruption is coming? How do we keep those guiding principles, those goals and metrics in, in our mind as our criteria? But how do we also try to pick up the pace a little bit? And how do we think about partnering with industry and with technology differently because the other thing we can't afford to do we had a conversation about this earlier today technology changes so quickly by the time we make an investment and we get it out there and it's implemented it's obsolete so we have to figure out a way to partner differently public private partnerships in the to date have really been talking about really big capital projects and that's not that those aren't going to still happen and maybe do a little bit more of them but i think that they are probably more like diamonds in the rough I think there's a really unique space in, in a smaller, more strategic space of doing transportation projects, probably more operational, less capital heavy, where we have an opportunity to really work collaboratively 
with the private sector, with industry, but we've got to be very clear about what does that mean? What's the goal? What's the outcome we're trying to reach? What do I bring to the table, whether I'm the public sector or the industry sector or the institutional sector, and what do I need out of it? And the city and county of Denver did some work with Panasonic, and everyone was like, oh, this is going to be great. We've got this unique technology partnership, public-private partnership. It's going to be super. And they created this list of all the things we were going to accomplish. But guess who created the list? The people at the top created the list and said, yeah, this is great. And then it was handed to those of us that had to actually implement it and went, this is dumb. <laughs> Why would we do this? Why would we develop a smart bus shelter out in a part of town where there's very little transit and no riders on the transit that's there? Why would we do that? So making sure we're bringing in not only the folks who make the decisions, but also the folks that have to deliver and implement things on a regular day. And always thinking, always thinking about, back to the right of way, how does this all fit? It's all the same space, and we're competing for everything all the time. Ah, oh, wrong button. So back to that pedestrian realm. How do we make our decisions? What are the solutions adding value? Is it helping our customers? Those are the things we need to be thinking about when we're making policy decisions, design decisions, community decisions, transportation decisions. And we also have to be thinking about does it actually fit in with our, our workforce, with our staff? One of the challenges that we've come up with with some of the technology that's out there, well, I'll pick on scooters for a little bit. The scooters came, everyone kind of freaked out. This was just as I was leaving the city and county of Denver. And on the one hand, I called a friend of mine who was in the midst of what they were calling scooter apocalypse. And they said, she was like, oh my gosh, my life is terrible. I am just inundated with all these issues and problems with relative to scooters. And I said to her, so I'm going to give you an observation from my very newfound space outside of the city and county of Denver walls and the, the crazy that happens in there. And she said, OK, what is it? I said, here's what I see. People riding scooters and having fun. What we're also seeing, however, is that because we let them come in and we knew they were coming, but we didn't do the work to look at the ordinance and say, how does the ordinance classify scooters? They're classified as a toy. And therefore, they have to be on the sidewalk. So we didn't fix the ordinance, but we let them all in and told them to ride on a sidewalk at 15 miles an hour. Not a good idea. Uh, really bad idea, actually. But at the same time, if we created the space for them on, on the roadways, you know, put them in with the bike lanes, that's what makes more sense. But we don't have the complete network for the bikeways either. So being thoughtful about how this is going to work in your public right-of-way. The other thing to be thoughtful about is in terms of your staff workload, OK, so the scooters come in and say, yep, we're going to do this. Or the bicycles, the dockless bikes come in. We're going to do this. We'll take care of it. Don't worry. Your right of way will be fine. And, and then and you guys have seen the pictures. I mean, some of them are really terrible. You see scooters being thrown in trash cans and scooters that are you know, being thrown down the storm drain and tons of bikes that are just hanging out and blocking the sidewalks. And do, how responsive are the companies to come and take care of that? Or does that begin to suddenly be uh, what we like to call other duties as assigned. And then your staff that already had a day, day job now has an evening job and a morning job because they're doing these, things, these unintended consequences of the work that we have to worry about. So that's both um, the work itself, but also financial. And so are these solutions taking up space and helping us meet our goal? Or are they taking up space and not helping us meet our goal? Those are the things we need to keep in mind moving forward. So my husband said, this is a really busy slide. I said, that's kind of the point. <laughs> but this is actually a slide that I made when I was talking about the smart cities a year or so ago. Because from an internal perspective, at, as a staff level, this is exactly what innovation feels like. All this stuff coming at you at the same time, and your policy and, and community leaders just saying, make it all fix, you know, like work magically. And you're like, I, I don't even know where to start. And so again, if we can be strong, both internally at the staff level, but also with our policy and elected leaders and community leaders, do we agree that those goals we set at the beginning, those outcomes we said we're striving for, do we agree on those? Do we hold them dear to our heart? Do we use them to help answer this question and help us have priorities? Because if everything is a priority, if everyone has to be happy, then there are no priorities, and everyone will continue to be angry. 
We have to set ourselves up with guidelines and guidance so that we can say yes, but also so that we can say no. And sometimes politicians don't like to hear that. No one wants to say no, and we have to. So these are three quotes I've been using for a while that I love dearly with regards to the status quo, innovation, and leadership. And I like them in this order. And you've probably all, this is, they're probably not new quotes to you, but Henry Ford said, if I'd asked my customer what they want, they told me a faster horse. So if we ask our customers today, what do you want? I want to go faster. I want to get to my places more quickly. I want to park in front of my location, and I don't want to have to pay for any of it. That is not an acceptable answer because it's completely unrealistic. And so those of us that are in positions of leadership, public, private, industry, what have you, we have to be willing to be honest with our public and say, not possible. So I love the Rosalind Carter quote. It's one of my favorite quotes and has been forever. A leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go but ought to be. And that is exactly where we are with the transportation system. That is exactly where we are with our public right of way. We have to be willing to take choices. We have to be willing to fall on our sword for a few things. We have to be willing. I was sharing earlier, uh, someone a long time ago gave me a postcard, and it was a painting, and it was a gentleman, and he's walking on a tightrope. And as he's walking on the tightrope, he's laying the rope out. This is where we are right now in transportation. This is where we are from a perspective of leadership. We have to be willing to step out into an uncharted territory and say, I believe in our goals and our outcomes, and I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to say no to things, because that's where we need to go. And then the last one, I love this quote, if we did everything we were capable of, we would literally astound ourselves. We hold ourselves back, either as individuals or as communities. Oh, it's not possible, or it's going to be too hard. Yes, all of those things. But if we work better together, if we take the time, we can go, we might go slow at start first, but we will go faster when we keep moving forward. So part of the reason I love being a planner, I don't know if we said, yeah, I'm a planner, I'm not an engineer. I used to joke that I play one on TV. I always often say that I am a, a translator of engineers to regular human beings who don't have any idea what they're talking about because it's just a different language. Um, but I love making stuff up. And I, I say that to my staff, and they're like, well, look at me this look. I'm like, no, 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 I don't, don't mean that in a, in a bad way or a malicious way or a just flying by the seat of my pants way. I love making stuff up because then you can go and make it happen. And that's what I loved about working for the city and county of Denver and working in transportation. Five years ago, I said, I think we need to create a Denver transit plan. And the city council people at the time were like, why would we do that? We have a transit agency. They're like, that's their job, not our job. I'm like, is it not our job? We have a growing city. We have a constrained right-of-way. We need to move more people. We need to use our right-of-way more efficiently. I think the city and county of Denver has something to say about how transit operates on our public rights-of-way. No, 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 no. Like we watered that seed for about three years. And then one of the council people said, you know what we need? We need a transit plan. I'm like, that's a great idea. So we got the money and we did the transit plan and they're just about finishing that up. So when I say I like to make things up, that's what I mean, is you can make things up. And when you work for a public sector agency, you also get to go implement them and see them out in the world, which is pretty fun too. Uh, so the future, revisiting that future. And I've said it already many times. Do we believe in that stated future? Do we want to get to this place where we have are safe, where it's affordable and reliable and accessible, and it works for all kinds of people, and you don't really have to think about it. I don't have to check the schedule and say, okay, all right, the bus comes in 30 minutes, and then I'm going to make that connection, and then I'll have to have 15 minutes in between there, and then I'll go. Not, we're not going to use it. We're not going to use it. Several years ago, I was, sat, I was on a panel at a sustainability conference, and it was out on the West, Cor West Colfax which is where we were building a light rail line. It wasn't open yet, and we were in, the, in an empty shell of an office building. So no one, no one officed in this building on a regular basis. The transit line wasn't open, although the bus was literally right there. And we were all there to talk about sustainability. And I didn't create any um, prepared remarks that day. And when I got up to do my part, I looked out the window. And you know what, what I saw? 
a full parking lot. All of us were there to talk about sustainability, whether it was from a housing perspective or a transportation perspective or whatever, and we all drove in our single occupancy vehicles, myself included. And I called us all on our bad behavior, and I said, if we are not building the system so that we are willing to take it, we have failed. We will build the system and really be thinking about, particularly from a transit perspective, we don't treat our transit riders very well. And often that's the only choice they have. And you look at bus transit stops, and oftentimes it's a stick, not even a sidewalk, no shelter. We need to treat our transit riders like human beings with dignity and respect. So we fix that transit system and treat them better and make it actually work so it's convenient and competitive with driving a, a car by ourselves. They have much better lives. They have much better transit. They have a lot more access. It's much more convenient. They can maybe work two jobs and still pick up their kids without you know, spending three hours on a bus. And if some of us that have the means to have a choice of driving a car, if we join them, that's icing on the cake. Revisiting step number three. Have we defined good metrics and goals? Do we believe in what we've said our stated outcomes are, even if some of them are hard, like the Vision Zero goal? When we asked this question, as I said before, everyone said yes. I said, great, let's keep going. But here's a fear I have. In 2015, when we started doing this work with the Mayor's Mobility Working Group, they do polling every year. Politicians do this. I was learning on an annual basis, and they see what issues come up. In 2014, transportation wasn't in the top 10. In 2015, number one, number two, right up there with affordable housing. 2016, number one, number two, right up there with affordable housing. 2017, number seven. So, Will the political winds blow us in another direction and say, oh, it's not important to the people anymore, so we don't have to worry about it, because they don't have the long game in mind. This is a long game, and so this is how we, as transportation professionals, as city builders, hold ourselves accountable and also our community elected leaders and be willing to step out. I have a friend who likes to say, step out into traffic. I'm like, oh, don't, don't step out into traffic, that's dangerous. But can we step out and lead? And can we acknowledge, we talked about this already, that our land use approach isn't sustainable? That this idea, sort of Her Ozzie and Harriet American dream, isn't going to work everywhere. That, and I actually found a cartoon, I didn't use it, like the changing American dream. And the last slide, uh, uh, the last frame of this cartoon shows someone in an apartment building. And is like, that's OK. It's OK to live in an apartment building. It's OK to live in a condo. What do we do with all that anyway most of the time? We drive our car right into our garage, and then we get in, and we don't even go outside. We don't talk to our neighbors. We don't use the yards. Like how, we've got to use our space more efficiently. And so how do we start having that more honest conversation from a policy perspective and with our public about where we're going and, and what it's going to look like? And, and like I said, we're, we're not all going to end up to be Tokyo. Not, and some of us probably don't want to be. We're, like, we're all going to come to Moscow instead. <laughs> but we've got to be thinking big picture. We've got to be thinking further out in terms of what is it going to take to move more and more people more efficiently. I talked earlier, I'll digress for just a minute. I talked earlier with some of the students about a game that we created back in 2008. It was called the right of way game. Uh, it was part of uh, the Living Streets initiative that we were working on. And so uh, oh, it was very simple. We would print out uh, large maps, pictures, basically an aerial photograph of a, of a street. And then we created puzzle pieces, more or less. And we said, you know, here's a bike lane. Here's a transit lane. Here's a planted median. Here's a sidewalk. Here's a tree lawn. Here's a car lane. And we said, well, we took it out to the public, and we said, you build it. Your street, build the street. So the first place we did this was out in a more of a suburban part of town. And the gal says, well, I don't know what street this is. I said, it's Chambers. It's the street outside at the door, your street. She goes, OK. So she builds the street. 
She comes over and she taps me on the shoulder and she says, I think I'm done. I think I've got it. I said, great. Let's go take a look. And as we're looking at it, she goes, oh, I didn't put any lanes in for the cars. Is that a problem? <laughs> so what we say we want and how things are going to work and her helping people have the reality is really important. In another neighborhood, we did it and we had a business owner on the main street and he said, I value on-street parking. And we had a community member, a mom with young children around the corner, and she said, the heck with your on-street parking. We need a wider sidewalk so it's safe for me to walk with my family. So we don't always agree on what good looks like. And so how do we have these hard conversations moving forward? So mobility freedom for all. Do we believe it's possible? Can we create a transportation system that works for everyone? <laughs> all ages and ability, that doesn't isolate our aging population. I'm going to tell a terrible story. I shared it with some of you earlier today, maybe only one of you. I was talking to my aunt a week or so ago, and she was supposed to go on a trip to New York. And she says, oh, she said, I'm not going to New York anymore. I said, why not? She says, oh, you know, my brother-in-law in Montana, he passed away, and we were going to go up for his funeral. I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. What happened? Had he been ill? And she said, no, he... Um, he went into a Cabela's to buy a gun. And they said, oh, what are you buying the gun for? And then he said, well, if I don't pass my driver's test, I'm going to kill myself. He's somewhere between 70 and 75. And they didn't sell him the gun, and they got him some help. Um, unfortunately, when he went to take his driver's test, he didn't pass. He had to give up his license. And then he stopped eating. And three weeks later, he passed away. So, and I don't, I don't know more about his situation or his story, like where he lived in Montana, if he was somewhere rural or if he was in a town or what his social structure was like, but he felt that isolated by not having the keys to his car, that he chose to kill himself rather than live life and figure out a different way to move around because we attach so much of our freedom to our mobility and our rights and our ability to drive a car. We've got to have communities that are more connected and give people an opportunity to be more social and have access to the things that we need in our community. We're social human beings. We've got to spend time together. So do we believe in this dream that we can have mobility freedom? It's not easy. There are no silver bullets. There's no magic pixie dust. But are we willing to sort of dig in and do the work and success will require dreamers, people who like to make stuff up like me, entrepreneurs, advocates, engineers, planners, urban designers, community and elected leaders, business leaders. And it will require us to work with integrity and accountability on a day-to-day -day basis. And those are not always easy choices for us to make. But that's where we are. And I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Hopefully this didn't sound like terrible, like we're never going to get there. I think we can absolutely get there if we keep our eyes on the prize and we're willing to work together and bring different disciplines and listen to one another and really put our nose down and focus. And that is it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. We have some questions from the audience. My students. Anybody? Yes, there's one here. Let me uh, let me get this over to you. you don't have to speak loud, All right. Sorry. All right. So I we've had the Safe House to School program here for many years. The university it's housed here, and we worked with our local schools. I'm wondering what are some of the really innovative you've, things that you've seen with helping children safely walk and bike to school? <laughs> so the question is, what are we doing from an innovative perspective to help children walk or bike to school? Um, I, this, is, <laughs> this is a place where, there are, again, there's no easy answers. And part of the challenge is, is that every school district is different. So in Denver, for instance, we have school choice. So I may live across the street from an elementary school, but I choose, because it's not a very good school, because we in this country generally don't resource our schools similarly, 
they depend on property taxes and property taxes depend on how the value of your house is. So I don't send my kid to school over there. I'm going to send them across town. And so in Denver, that typically means as a parent, you've got to figure out how to get your kid there. So we create transportation problems. And so the city has a group of individuals that work with the Denver Public Schools Administration and also with the principals at each school to try to figure out the best traffic control plan. But that situation is one that we've created for ourselves, quite frankly. Those are policy decisions that we've made. Uh, you know, when you get, Denver doesn't have enough uh, staff to be able to sort of do a lot of that encouragement and engagement, so that's something we rely on the uh, advocacy community to do. But where you have active community, and they'll you know, be willing to say, we'll have a, a bike to work day, or a bike to school day, or a walking school bus, or things of that nature, and you just do it, that's when you see a lot of um, people starting to change and, and act differently, and they do it on a regular basis, and it becomes normal. Uh, we do try to you know, address some of the safety situations around there, and, and again, all these are policy issues, and many of them are operational in nature. Am I willing to put in a four-way stop sign? Am I willing to put in a pedestrian mid-block crossing? Am I willing to, and I, I said this to my uh, engineers, this was years ago, right when the Safe Routes program started, and there was, we got some money to do a pedestrian uh, refuge island, and it was gonna be the only one on a roadway that was like two miles long that had one other stoplight that was never triggered unless someone pushed the button. So I said, well, rather than just doing the one, why don't we do three? where we know we have some crossing. They said, no, 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 we can't. So I think sometimes we err on the side of what the rules are versus and expecting people to follow the rules. But we're all human beings, and we don't follow the rules. We don't follow the rules when we drive, much less when we walk or ride a bike. So how do we kind of watch human behavior and have human behavior and learn from that and make it as safe as possible for what people are going to do anyway? So. Another question. Down here. I was wondering that green infrastructure. Yeah. Sort of like this overview. How do you transition? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So how do you do greener urban uh, development um, from a sustainable infrastructure perspective? There are some great guidelines that the city of Denver put together recently. They're called the Ultra Urban Design, Water Quality Design Guidelines. I might not have that totally right. Um, but so five years ago or so, I hired a woman, Sarah Anderson. We had this whole big struggle over who was going to get Sarah Anderson and who was going to develop a water quality plan for the city because the folks over in water wanted it because they wanted to control it. And we knew that it needed, we needed to have a more innovative approach. And so we put her in my team with a group of planners. And she has created these fantastic guidelines. And we've been working together to say, OK, A, Sarah needs her own money to implement her program. But we also have money in transportation to do all kinds of things. So let's talk on a regular basis. And where do we find that synergy and make sure that we're supplementing those dollars and building better pro projects together? So we look for opportunities for, say, a protected bike lane where we've got water quality needs and bike protected needs. So rather than just doing the bollards, the plastic bollards that are run over and look like crap in like a day, let's work with Sarah, Sarah Anderson and the water quality so we can actually have that work. Yes, so those are the things that we're trying to work towards. It's not necessarily done, but you're working towards that. And the way she did um, her guidelines is really thinking about it for a semi-arid place like Denver is and like Moscow is, it, you know, it's, we can't just pick up what they did in Portland and bring it to Denver because everything will die. <laughs> and that won't work either. No one wants it to look like. But it's finding, because the resources are so limited, finding those synergies and finding those partners that are willing to work together where you can sort of do, you know, get more out of the bang for your buck. That's the opportunity. Yeah. One more question. Go ahead. Yeah. And so that changed. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah.
Uh, it's a good question, and, and, and the, did everyone hear the question, how do you anticipate behavioral changes when you're making these types of infrastructure changes? There is a whole group of people at NREL that I've been working with that are trying to actually anticipate sort of and develop the behavior of ur and urban behavior, urban behavior that folks have and sort of turn it into a science and understand, okay, if we do this, will folks do why? Um, and so there's some of that that I think we're taking into consideration, but it's like we're trying to predict what people will do. And, and sometimes we get asked to prove that people will use some infrastructure. And so I, I was telling folks earlier in the day on Monday in my class, I had David Pulsifer come and speak. He uh, does a lot of pedestrian planning, and he had a slide of he showed a beautiful river, and it was fall colors. And he said, you know, we don't... Um, count how many people are swimming across a river before we decide to build a bridge for people to drive cars across. We build a bridge because we need the connectivity. <laughs> so later, as I was sitting in the airport in Seattle on the way to come here, I found, came across an article in the Seattle Times about the I-90 and a $6.2 million investment they made for elk to cross the street. And so I, I wrote him a note. I said, do you think they counted the elk? And we were joking about that earlier in the day. Like, yeah, they were probably all dead elk. Um, but so at some point, which is why we have to be a little bit brave in the work that we're doing, there may not be a, a, a way for us to say for certain that someone's going to use the facility or that these hordes of people are going to come. But how do we build the safe transportation system and the safe infrastructure so that people feel comfortable in making the, and knowing that they have a choice, that they are not like the gentleman in Montana who felt like the only way he had to get around was in his car. We've got to give people choices and give them opportunity. It's an important point. Let me thank Chrissy, and we're going to have a little presentation, but let's give her a round of applause for us. Thank you. Michael, you want to come up with me? Dean Stopper, would you join us also? Thank you. Thank you. Would you join us also, please? Our Dean of Engineering, uh, Dean Larry Stopper, if you would just join us. A little thank you from uh, the University of Idaho. Oh, we hope you. you'll remember us and Absolutely. come back and visit. And uh, really, thank everybody for coming today. We'll just take a quick photo of the. And stay here just a moment. <laughs> Michael's fantastic. wall is filling up. This is his third. He gets one too. <laughs> Let's thank Michael for being such a, uh, a good sport. And also, um, move up a little further. We're hiding. Yeah, <laughs> hiding. will always be a good sport. Thank you for giving us a reason to have this wonderful celebration. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll see you all next year. Actually, before that, I hope. <laughs> Super.